recording. Thank you. Thank you, Benedetta. Uh, so I'm Chiara Cavagna and uh, welcome to everybody. I am head of the Education and Public Awareness Department at uh, Doctors with Africa CUAM. And the CUAM is a, an international NGO based uh, in Italy. We have been working in Africa for <laughs> 73 years uh, to strengthen the local health system. Our mission is uh, to advocate uh, the universal right to health and uh, uh, to promote uh, uh, some important values, uh, such as uh, international solidarity, justice, and peace. Here, I just want to very briefly explain the reason of this uh, workshop and how it was born. Uh, Mind Changer is uh, a European project funded by the European Commission, and it is implemented by Regione Piemonte in, in Italy and the other partners in Germany, France, Spain, Romania, and Belgium. As part of this project, CUAM is going to implement a number of activities uh, to raise awareness among young people on the issues of the 2030 Agenda, global health and climate change in particular. And this one um, is uh, the first activity we are going to implement during this year. And uh, it is an activity uh, which uh, was conceived, wished for, and managed by young people and students. In particular, they are young Italian medical students from Turin and uh, Novara University who virtually met some young uh, Ugandan activists who are part of the association Action Coalition on Climate Change. And all these young people have been thinking uh, together about the issues uh, you will uh, hear this evening and uh, how to present to them. I don't want to tell you anymore. I just want to start uh, our meeting, uh, but I want to uh, I thank um, Enoch Nimpa Maya, the director of uh, Ugandan Association ACCC. And I also want to thank Byron and uh, the SISM students uh, from Turin and uh, Novara, in particular, Arianna. Uh, they have been working at this meeting for weeks uh, in their spare time uh, with a view to peer education and uh, mutual contamination. So really, really thank you for your job. Um, and now I leave the floor to Ariana. You can start. Okay, so thank you, Chiara, so much also for the opportunity to be here. So as you said, I'm Ariana Nizitti, and I'm a medicine student and a member of SISM, which is an organization of medicine students for medicine students. And our goal is to um, organize different activities to improve uh, theoretical and practical skill for uh, uh, medicine students, but, but not only us. <laughs> and also to improve health in every in different way. And that's why we are truly happy to be here and have the opportunity to talk with you guys from ACCC in Uganda and to talk about uh, climate change, uh, which we know being really related to um, health problem. So before I let you talk, I just want to say that I'm going to leave um, uh, a link in the chat for Pigeonhole, where you can write some question during the meeting if you have, and it's all anonymous. So if you want, otherwise, if you prefer to speak with them, and ask them some question directly, just write an asterisk in the chat and then I let you I let you speak. Okay. So thank you for the attention and I'll let Byron speak and introduce yourself. All right. Um thank you so much, Ariana. Um I think before I speak. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to let um, either Steven or Enoch, who is on the call, to just uh, say a little one or two things about Action Coalition on Climate Change as well, uh, in case uh, people don't know what it is, and in case uh, they want to know a little bit more about ACCC. Uh, so 
Um, maybe I'll ask uh, Stephen, uh, who is on call, uh, to just briefly uh, talk about A Triple C and uh, what uh, what A Triple C is all about. Stephen, over to you. And in case Stephen doesn't have uh, access to, maybe Enoch can take over now. Enoch, do they have access uh, to that? Okay. Thank you, many thanks, and uh, good evening to you all. I'm glad to be part of this meeting, and uh, I'm happy for the for the team, real Lilian and uh, Bailon, who have been at the core of organizing this uh, meeting. Particularly, Action Coalition on Climate Change was established in 2007 as uh, a non-government non organization. It's a national uh, organization. It, it operates countrywide, and uh, we have partnerships uh, within the region, that is East Africa and beyond. So um, our core activity largely is uh, to do with environment, uh, climate change, uh, public health, gender human rights, uh, we do uh, work on petroleum and extractives. And our vision is to ensure um, that there is improved livelihoods for sustainable, uh, to improve, uh, to ensure that we utilize the natural resources and uh, uh, our environment for the benefit of all the citizenry. Uh, so that is what AC stands for. Uh, so Bailon, I think in the course of uh, the conversation, you should take it upon yourself and uh, you paste in the chat box uh, the, our, our, our social media handles and our website so that uh, uh, members from the Italian side can be able to read uh, extensively uh, from what we are doing because we have limited time here. I can't give too much preamble of what Action, Action Coalition on Climate Change does, uh, but at least I've just tried to give a, a short or quick uh, glimpse of what uh, Action Coalition on Climate Change entails. Uh, over to you, members. Thank you. OK, so great. Uh, we already have collected some questions where we can start from. And then I just remember you guys the link in the chat, or if you want to book yourself, just write an asterisk. OK, so let's start with this one. Like, uh, how does climate change specifically affect Africa? Like, Biden? If, okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay. All right. Um, I'd, we had uh, we had organized that uh, some people would uh, answer that, but um, just to maybe uh, give my thoughts is climate change obviously has uh, had a very significant impact on Africa, uh, affecting various particular areas in the continent from the environment itself to the economy to even the society that we live in. And so um, things, I think one of the things that uh, climate change has affected the most in Africa is agriculture and food security. And so um, in Uganda, agriculture is mainly our, our backbone. It's what we, it's what we survive on. Uh, it's our main source of livelihood. And so um, it's very vulnerable because of climate change and changes in rainfall patterns, for example, uh, in, increased frequency of droughts, floods currently happening, there even um, there is some bit of landslides happening all over the country currently. And so this has re greatly reduced or has produced some sort of some sort of instability in the food production, but also water availability. We we don't have a constant flow of water. Some people don't have water in some seasons, others have so um agriculture and food security is one of the areas that climate change has specifically impacted um maybe we can talk a little bit about health as well um i think that climate change has implications for public health in africa particularly increasing temperatures that can 
bring about say uh, vic vector borne diseases, for example, like malaria, uh, diarrhea, fever, cholera. And so um, we, we realized that, of course, when the rain, when the rain is too much, there is a lot of stagnant water. It's conducive for the mosquitoes to, you know, be many. And so that later on causes uh, malaria. So I think uh, these are some of the few. The others are more economic. I'd mentioned uh, where, of course, like I mentioned before, Uganda, particularly, I speak as a Ugandan, that we depend on agriculture for our sustainability. And so if the climate is bad or it's unstable or there's a lot of climate change, it causes some sort of economic, uh, some sort of economic challenge for us as Ugandans. And then it leads to either poverty or something like that. So I think um, to answer your question, uh, Ariana, uh, these are some of the impacts that have um, that have that have affected us. And again, I need to mention that, of course, it's important also to note that the impacts vary from country and regions uh, because of we we are different. Everyone, every country in Africa goes through particular climatic conditions, either social economic con factors also are at play. So developing adaptive strategies um, is, is, and investing in climate change, I think will help us have a, uh, have a long lasting, uh, some sort of long lasting solution per se for us, but also it helps us to mitigate the uh, the adverse effects of climate change in Africa. Those are my few thoughts, Ariana. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Bayo. And so the next question would be: uh, so, what are the main disease and health conditions associated with climate change? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Can Can anyone else take that on? <laughs> Yeah, just slow it to the members. Uh, if one, uh, you know, they had prepared a specific question for specific questions. So if uh, one is unable, then that's when we can chip in to barista them. But otherwise, oh. uh, somebody should be there to answer this. Uh, can, I, can I give it a try? Hello? Yes, Edgar. Yes, Edgar. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for, for the opportunity, sir. Uh, so the question is asking about the diseases eh, that come uh, from climate change. Yeah? And uh, basically in Africa, the diseases we have, mostly here in Uganda, uh, we have malaria, one of the most common diseases that affects the people. And it's spread through like uh, mosquito bites. Eh? And uh, these bites uh, come come from mosquitoes, which are, which are, which are... Edgar, did we lose you? You're muted. Mm, I think by oh, you can uh, somebody uh, chip. Sorry, chip. can you hear me again? Yes. Yes, you can hear you. Uh, sorry, I had, I had some network. Uh, and uh, then we have been speaking of malaria, which is caused by mosquito bite. Then there is a uh, Zika virus. It's also caused by a mosquito bite. And there is a uh, dengue fever. It's also from mosquito bites. And uh, these mosquitoes are mostly in places that are flooded due to effects of climate change. We've seen the floods in the swampy areas of Uganda that are... That are when this water is collected in these areas, this stagnant water, the mosquitoes like lay their eggs in the water and their larvae. So it increases their populations and hence these mosquitoes go out in the public and they and they spread these diseases, malaria, dengue fever, Zika virus. Then we also have cholera, which is a, a waterborne disease spread by uh, taking stagnant water. And it's also as a result of like uh, floods they're coming into human populations. So people who have no access to clean tap water, when they take this contaminated water, they get sick of cholera. And uh, also we have diarrhea, which is also like a, 
which also comes from taking uh, stagnant water. So all these diseases like uh, they have a direct link to climate change. And we've seen some of them come from the vectors, the, the mosquitoes, and some come from directly taking uh, stagnant water. I don't know if COVID-19, I don't have the proof yet, but uh, I think those are the diseases I knew personally. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. I see Muyana yes. with the Can hands I, up. Don't... If you want to talk, please. Yes. Can I add on Ariana? What? Sorry? Can I add on, on what the previous presenter was saying? Okay. I James, that... Yes, James uh, Muyanya uh, raised uh, his hands. James, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I just saw that you have your hands up if you want to talk. Yes. Otherwise, you uh... will... James, go ahead. Maybe James uh, can't listen to us in this moment. And there is also Stephen Magume. Okay, yes. thank you very much. Incidentally, I've joined the rather late. I may not know by name uh, each and every participant. What we have to appreciate is that uh, Africa as a continent, and more especially the tropical regions, these ones, the regions that are crossed by equator, are very fertile grounds for both the survival of human beings and the vectors plus the pests that affect their crops. So apart from the direct effect on human population by rampant malaria as caused by an office female mosquito, of course, there are other species of mosquitoes which are responsible for other forms of uh, for other forms of malaria fever, malaria fever. So, even before climate change set in, we were already a hotbed for various tropical diseases, and especially malaria being the most predominant that is responsible for child mortality and morbidity and the loss and death of pregnant mothers year in, year out. What we have also to appreciate is that there are reservoir hosts. Almost all the animals in the protected areas are reservoir hosts for certain vectors or disease-causing organisms, including the infective part of life cycle for tri trypanosomiasis or Nagana for animals. So we are at a loss as a result of climate change due to loss of human beings in physical terms, loss of his food, both of animal and plant origin. We have had, for example, prolonged, severe and prolonged droughts. And naturally, I happen to be a biologist, both a botanist and zoologist. The organisms or vectors are beginning to adapt to the change in the situation. They are, for example, recently I tested for malaria, which could not be could not be observed in the blood sample. But after just two hours, it was full blown malaria. So it appears when even these plasmodia have entered the human body, they have had some areas tied in such that they are not as quickly observed and therefore annihilated as possible, which must be a factor of climate change as these organisms, because every organism aims at surviving through and throughout time. Therefore, they modify their breeding habits, they, they, mod, they adapt to the changed environment, both of the severe and prolonged drought, and also when there are floods and mudslides. So we are not safe on both fronts, on the climate change in the direction of severe and, uh, and the long droughts, 
nor are we safe because most of the diseases, especially in trop tropical regions, can be waterborne as well as airborne. So to say, so to say, for a country like Uganda, which is gifted in all ways, in water abundance, in biodiversity abundance, when you see we are being hit hard by floods, that is an indicator that other vulnerable countries, including the South African countries, Mozambique, Angora, all those have been hardest hit by floods and attendant diseases that emerge out of the two extremes of climate change. My submission. Okay, so thank you. And Enoch? I see your hands up. Hello, um, I hope I can uh, audibly be heard. Uh, in addition, I want to make a rejoinder on the supplement what Stephen has submitted. Uh, in Uganda, there are certain places which should not to be um, known for harboring vectors that transmit mal uh, malaria. Those are the mosquitoes, the vectors. We have some places in southwestern Uganda. Those places until 1990s, we had limited records regarding the uh, incidences of malaria. But as a result of climatic changes, now these areas have been infested with such kind of vectors and there are numerous reports for uh, people in there suffering from malaria. So to say the least, uh, we, uh, we have to be observant that with changes in precipitation temperatures and rainfall, uh, also the disease patterns keep on changing. Uh, we have certain diseases which were not reported in some places, which are now uh, prevalent. So I just needed to make this re uh, rejoinder uh, for the benefit of uh, the discussion and the rest of the team. Okay, so thank you. And the next question is about malnutrition. So what are the risks uh, to food security and malnutrition in Africa due to climate change? So, uh, patient, I don't know if it's right how I pronounce it. Yes, it's patience. Thank you. <laughs> so, climate change, like climate change threatens food, food security in Africa by reducing the food availability and production, and production of crop yields and livestock. It we also see that the extreme weather events like floods, floods, droughts, and also other patterns affect agricultural production and also food safety. We have, ex we have also seen situations in some areas where floods and flash, flash lands and landslides come and destroy crops in the field. And that makes it like very unsafe. And this in turn affects prices, which also indirectly reduces availability of this food to the rural communities. And also the increased floods have also damaging the infrastructure developments in developing countries. For instance, in Uganda, we have seen a case scenario of River Katonga where the bridge got broken by an increase in water level. The, the river bank just burst and people from one part, one part, people from the other district of Masaka couldn't easily access the city. And Masaka is known to produce to produce large chunks of matoke, jackfruit. And so people in town kind of experienced high food prices and also limited availability of those foods. Yeah, we have also seen that these unpredicted weather patterns also try to affect the food systems, the food, yeah, affect the food systems basically. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And please, Edgar.
Uh, thank you again. Uh, I, I just have an addition on patients' points, like uh, a change in climate. Uh, for example, like the floods that take over the land surface, uh, they cause to loss of arable land, which is used for farming, hence affecting the production of food. So this is one of the ways. Uh, the other ways, like uh, climate change, can indirectly cause like uh, food insecurity. Then there is also an issue of uh, shifts in growing season, like uh, the growing seasons could change due to the climate change. For example, in some cases, we used to have like like lengthy growing seasons in Uganda, but due to climate change now, I think they are reduced. Yeah, I think that's just what I wanted to add. Okay. And uh, Kule, I see your hand. And then we also have a question in, in the chat on Pigeon Hall. Oh, okay. So maybe Magum, Magum, if you want to talk. I see your hand. No. Okay. Okay, so I can read the question on Pigeon Hall. Oh, and... hello. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. <laughs> the impact of climate change on food and uh, by extension, household mm -hmm. income and general livelihoods is uh, enormous. Where we have had crops for both income and for food, Sometimes those who don't grow crops for food are able to sell food that is for income that fall within the cash crop category. But the extremes of weather in the direction of prolonged drought and the severity of drought at that and also the other extreme of torrential rain, heavy torrential rains that cause floods Either way, both crops, the food and the cash crops are affected. Grow, crops have their growth cycle from growing into the garden up to attaining the physiological maturity through to harvest and the rest of the kind. It so follows that when especially external factors in the environment that include moisture remain longer than otherwise expected, because here the processing of food is usually by sunshine, since it is abundant. And therefore there is great, especially in the times of heavy moisture and long water residence in the environment, all the food destroying organisms of fungal, bacteria, virus, or conspire to destroy good amount of food. In our case, Uganda, for example, we lose over 30% in post-harvest losses, which is a very huge loss. So to say, both the crops that are eaten directly and excess of which, of which is sold, plus the clearly delineated cash crops have all been affected. Recently, the country has faced who are worms. We have what we call African for worm and American for worm, or sharing the acronym of AFAW. They have caused a lot of menace, especially to the cereal maize, which is the dominant food crop in the land. And at the same time, it serves as a cash crop and also as a source of animal feed. This is precise for hunger and famine, both within the country and within Kenya. Kenya is already hit hardest by very severe drought. A good part of the country, over three quarters of Kenya have been hard hit, I mean, hit hardest. And we are always the source of uh, especially the maize. So to say, climate change has ramifications 
of food production at the level of household, at the level of national scale, regional, and some extent international, because of the devastating effect caused by the two extremes and climate variations. The seasonality of, of rainfall regimes as it alternated with sunshine, all those have been mixed up and farmers have been left vulnerable and given our low technological capability, we are not able to produce short duration crops in very high volumes. And even if we were to succeed in that direction, we lack the storage cap capabilities. And the internal factors of food plus the external factors of the environment all conspire in most cases to wipe out all the food that has been produced out of heavy investment of labor and the natural resources that every farmer can afford. So to say climate change has impact directly and indirectly on the human population and national income as well. Thank you. Thank you. And I see also Kule and Enoch, maybe Kule. Do you hear me? Oh, okay. Oh, Enoch, please. <laughs> I see your hands. If you want to add something about it, Enoch. Yeah, yeah many thanks. Um, uh, thank you so much. I want to make a mention that uh, as a result of climatic changes and, uh, and uh, onto our environment at large, it has uh, put a lot of uh, critical uh, pressure on our public health infrastructure. To the extent uh, that our country is struggling uh, to provide the uh, health services to the citizenry. Now, in the process that the country is struggling, in the end, we end up being forced to uh, look for uh, uh, funds from the outside world, that is to say China, the Americas, uh, in the US, Europe, and all that. So all this uh, is, not, is not attainable and sustainable, but our country has been pushed uh, to borrow enormously, especially if you look at the Ministry of Health, uh, so that they can be able to cope uh, uh, with the uh, rise in the incidences of diseases, much of which are attributed to the climatic changes. Um, that is uh, uh, what I needed to mention uh, at this particular juncture. But also, uh, I need to make a mention that uh, if you look at the structure of agriculture in, in Uganda, it is largely informal. Uh, we should have what we call indigenous technologies. Indigenous technologies, our elders in communities could easily predict uh, the seasons and uh, which crops could grow in those particular seasons. But gone are the days because there is now unpredictability uh, or, uh, in terms of seasons. That is to say, uh, seasonal variations are largely unpredictable. As a result of that, uh, we've had serious crop failure and of course, people are being forced into uh, 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 food shortages and uh, starvation and related uh, kind of uh, activity, including hunger. So I think I also needed to bring this to the attention uh, of the rest of the team. Over to you. OK, thank you. So I see that there are two questions in the chat on Pigeon Home. So the first one is, uh, is there a way we use the current trends in technology and artificial intelligence to our advantage in fighting climate change? If you want, if you want, I can also copy the question and I'll write it here so that you can read it. Okay. Okay. So um, I can I can I can answer a bit. 
Ariana? Yes, um, I think um, social media currently is one of our biggest um, influences and advocacy tools that we can easily, for example, current, right now we are using technology to spread uh, information about climate change. I mean, you're in Italy, I'm in, I'm in Uganda, and we're able to have a conversation and people are able to follow because of the technology that's there. And, um, you know, like that, we can easily impact climate change in a way. But also, I think, as talking about social media and saying that it's our biggest advocacy tool where uh, we can use it to our advantage. Um, I can easily talk to any social media, any particular influential person or any leader currently. Uh, it's as easy as going on to Twitter and saying, sharing my thoughts and just tagging them, either my area uh, leader, member of parliament, or whoever in terms of that. So I think that um, to answer the question is, is that way we can use current trends in technology to add uh, to our advantage? Yes, we can. We can use it a lot. I mean, they are very, um, very, very brilliant guys out there who are coming up with apps, who are coming up with ways uh, or uh, or artificial, artificially intelligent ways of determining the weather patterns in terms of um, determining how we can combat certain things and how we can um, help out. So yes, definitely we have to use it um, to our advantage currently now that we have it to um, advocate for climate change. I mean, uh, to, <laughs> to be advocates uh, and, and climate change activists. Yeah, over to you, Ariane. Okay, thank you, Byron. Um, I see the hand of Stephen Magoon. Okay, thank you very much. Definitely technology and innovations come in handy to address the impact of climate change before it graduates into a monster of high proportions. There is already a worry of climate change refugees and climate change permeates into all sectors of economy in health, in agriculture, in water supply, water important as it is, and all these other areas of human development endeavors. Definitely, we can now boast of over 60 universities in the case of Uganda and the condition by National Council of Higher Education is that each university emerging must have a science faculty, a science department. So to say to have science-led economic development agenda, we have some mathematicians who have the capabilities of modeling to know of the flooding, to predict the flooding regimes of certain areas and uh, even mass wastage of certain highland areas. But before we go to that extreme of high and hard science, Uganda and Africa in general have the comparative advantage of rich biodiversity. A case in point, especially with Uganda and indeed all those tropical countries. Our main God-given wealth was biodiversity. In the case of Uganda, we have uh, over five huge forests. We have almost an accountable wetlands of all sizes, permanent and seasonal. We have uh, five big lakes, one sixty minor lakes, very unaccountable streams. But almost each of all these national heritage resources have been destroyed to the extent that the rate at which we lose forests is highly unimaginable. So before we go hard science, which may not permeate to every part of the country, even when internet has not reached every corner of the country, if we did due diligence and protected the environment, protected the water towers, protected the fragile ecosystems, all of that would come in handy. And as Enoka had hitherto stated, we have all the indigenous knowledge. And now that 
almost every part of Uganda has had a pinch of sort of the impact of climate change. Any message in the direction of the amelioration of climate change impact with intervention physically and otherwise, I think at this point in time, Africa can register internal support. So I would uh, prefer that we galvanize all the resources available, including human resource, to restore the environment back as it were, as alongside we run adaptation and mitigation measures, plus incorporating into our production systems climate smart agriculture, plus climate tolerant species, varieties, and breeds of animals. Thank you that we leave the business as usual, where we think that Africa was endowed and therefore could afford to live without human interventions to change the environment and conserve resources that have serious survival implications to human race in this part of the world. I thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Enoch, please. Yeah, many thanks, uh, Iriana. Um, well, I think I need to take this conversation to some other different angle because you talked about artificial intelligence. Um, whether we are using artificial intelligence uh, to communicate climate change and how we can help the communities to be resilient. And uh, I think, uh, I, I, think well, I have some questions here for my uh, colleagues here in Uganda. Because number one, to what extent are we using this artificial intelligence? And in any case, number two, uh, which kind of artificial intelligence uh, uh, apps do we have in Uganda? Because even you might find that uh, some of the people whom we, whom we are having here, some of them have had artificial intelligence for the first time. Number, number three, uh, if you talk to a person, a common person uh, in the communities about artificial intelligence, this person will not understand you. Some of them don't have phones, or even when they have phones, they don't have these smartphones. So I think this artificial intelligence remains uh, with the elite and the intellectuals, uh, whereby they keep debating about these things. Uh, because um, uh, here in Uganda, largely, the information that we obtain regarding the climatic changes is, re uh, is from the ministry uh, of um, the ministry that is concerned with the environment, the meteorological uh, 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 directorate now uh, from the department is the one responsible for providing this information. But also, if you look at the technology that our country deploys, uh, in, for example, in weather forecasting uh, itself, it is so inaccurate. So we have lots of inefficiencies. We have lots, lots of deficits and we have lots of uh, technological gaps that we can really talk about. So let nobody really paint a big picture that in Uganda we are using artificial intelligence. No, really, we are really, uh, we are, we are really um, uh, basing on uh, what we see when it rains. Uh, we say, okay, when it doesn't rain, we keep crying. Uh, I mean, so uh, there are many issues. I think we have miles and miles away to reaching to what we can call artificial intelligence or when it can be applied up to the, lo the lowest uh, common person who is doing agriculture. I think I need to remind the, my friends who are in Italy that in Uganda, uh, over 70% of, of the country is largely uh, dependent on agriculture. And who does agriculture? It is the common person in the grassroots communities, in households. And therefore, if this common person who contributes 70% of food uh, in the country doesn't know uh, the artificial intelligence or the application of it, then what are we talking about? I remain, uh, I, I, I rest my case at this particular juncture. Okay, so thank you so much. And now I think that I can read next question, which is on Fijian Hall. And it is, uh, in the fight to battle the negative impacts of climate change, uh, do, we, do we really have hope it feels like the trends has not changed for a long time, and I am very worried. Nice question. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, so that's the question so that you can also read if you want. 
who want to answer? Okay, Loi. Uh, thank you, Ariana. Hello, everyone. Um, well, yes, we do have hope in terms of adaptation and mitigation measures that we can come up with. Uh, for example, in Uganda, climate change has, uh, has affected us. It is real. So people have different people in different regions have come up with different adaptation measures to combat or live with climate change. For example, people have adopted um, kitchen or urban farming to provide food. In this way, they use normal household um, wastes. For example, normal plastics, they uh, plant in plastics to, pro to, to grow food and they actually uh, grow vegetables and those simple, simple um, agriculture, um, uh, the simple plants like vegetables and fruits. So in that way, there is hope. Um, then for the case of um, livestock, people are doing receding and seeding for places that have the, like uh, dry lands. For example, in Northern Uganda, in Karamoja, they are, there are different projects that have come up. For example, uh, parish development model, and I don't think you know about it, but uh, those projects are helping uh, livestock farmers to restore the pastures. So they use native species, the native pasture species. They plant, they replant them, uh, ir irrigate them, so that they get them again. They use native species because they are already adopted. We know that they will grow well in our, our conditions. So with that, uh, animals can still feed. Then, um, of course, climate smart agriculture, uh, zero or minimum tillage to rest, it restores soil fertility, it restores a soil structure. It also helps sequestering in sequestering carbon. Then our planting of trees. Um, we all know the uses of trees. So in that way, we can slow climate change. We can slow down climate change and also live with it. So um, then also irrigation. For the uh, places that have been affected in terms of heat flashes, through irrigation, they can still practice their agriculture. So um, from this, I think I rest my case, maybe some additions from other people. Okay, so thank you. And I see uh, Lilian. Uh, thank you so much. Um, the other, other part of uh, local communities uh, trying to do adaptation of climate change. One, uh, we the local communities have tried to create awareness in the different uh, meetings that they always have. For example, uh, during the chairman LC1 meeting, they always encourage the people in their different villages to always plant trees irrespective of how small your uh, your land is, irrespective of where you stay, they're always encouraging them to, to plant trees. And this has helped them to, uh, to get information about climate change at their lowest levels. Then the other thing that the local communities have used, um, young people, most so in the slum areas in, in Uganda, mostly in Kampala, we go to them uh, ghetto areas. They have used music, dance, and drama, where we have seen these young people moving on streets, trying to, you know, to um, 
create awareness through the uh, music, dance, and drama. They they always uh, go alongside the road, trying to spread the information, but using you know uh, the dancing of you know for young people. And this has helped even those people who are not aware of the climate change uh, uh, effects. They are able to know through these young people's uh, innovations. But also when we talk about local communities, then we will not uh, forget people like um, uh, churches, you know, people like uh, our leaders in mosques who have huge following. And um, these people have also, you know, emphasized uh, things to do with uh, uh, adopting uh, alternative uh, sources of energy that have been you know, emphasizing that people have to use solar energy, people have to do with um, uh, cutting down trees to get charcoal, but rather adopt the other one, the, the, some of the things we call briquettes, and these are made from, um, they are made from uh, uh, the waste materials, and they can be able to, to be used to cook food. So uh, the, the, the leaders, the church leaders are able to emphasize those alternative sources of energy that can be able to, uh, to help them rather than, to help them to prepare food so, as a source of light, rather than cutting down uh, uh, trees to, to have charcoal for them to prepare food. I think that is, that is something I can add onto, uh, onto her submission. I submit. Okay, thank you so much. And then uh, Edgar. Uh, thank you again. Uh, actually, I'm the one who asked the question because uh, I wanted to get a clarification because uh, uh, I had all the answers given and uh, most of them were about like the adaptation. Eh? But my question was centered on like uh, the effects We've had a lot of like international agreements about climate change, a lot of efforts taken, but I want to see the effects on ground. The temperature of the world has been increasing. We have like a consistent warm trend in temperature rise. The greenhouse gases have been increasing. Like all these efforts have been put in place. People are trying to adapt to climate change, but we have like a reversal of climate change happening. Do you have that hope that like the climate will maybe reverse to the better? Because it feels like the I haven't seen that trend like going back when you look at the international records. You see, like the world is getting warmer and warmer. There isn't something like today, this year, I think I think the temperature has reduced. So I think that's the affirmation I kind of need, like the evidence that climate change is being reversed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we don't have any other question on Pigeon Hole, but uh, my question uh, is uh, how are local communities in Uganda adapting to climate change? Uh, Loy? Uh, the gentleman that, that just spoke was asking about um, if the climate effects right now are being reversed or can be reversed. Uh, what I can tell him is the earth is self-healing or self-regulating. But right now, the rate at which climate change is happening is way like 1,000 times faster than the earth can take in or can combat so in that that's why we have these um, there are a lot of effects that we are seeing like the floods the um, heat flashes and all so uh from my perspective i do not think there is a way we can there is a way we can combat it a hundred percent or reverse it a hundred percent. But what we can do is live with it 
healthy in a healthy way. So that is adaptation. I don't know if that answers what he, he was asking. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. And I also see a patient. Yes, I wanted to make a contribution and, and share my thoughts on how I think Ugandans adapting to climate change. Like most Ugandans nowadays, is that they are embracing the practice of agroforestry. This is like a traditional practice which has been there. They plant trees in their on their farms and also on their farms basically, and they aim at the trees providing for them, acting as windbreaks. Also, they also get food from the trees, and also these same trees also protect their crops from like direct heat and also when their leaves fall they they break down to form organic organic matter so this has been a traditional knowledge that's being reinforced nowadays i've also seen in some areas people local communities are vesting water from underground to cap the water shortage and and also use this water for irrigation because now when when the dry spell comes, most crops tend to dry up, so they they run to op they run for that option. In, in the northern communities, I've also seen people preserving food and storing food. Once they have their harvest, they always store their food, and like keep keep the jam in very safe for the next planting season. Eh? And using the traditional knowledge, most people also predict the weather patterns. Though nowadays the IK is trying to raise out, but the, our elders still do that. And in some societies, they still guide us. They know when it's going to rain, when, it's, when, when they know, okay, they, they can literally count the seasons for planting and harvesting or seasons for all seasons or maybe times of the year when they anticipate that there's going to be a very long like drought spell they always tend to have some measures and also i feel by by them sharing their stories they're still trying to adapt to climate change because when the young people get to know what's happening they'll always take action and they will always refer to what the el maybe the elders used to use and also try to save themselves. And, and also others, others go and invest food, food materials, food resources from food resources from the forests. I've mm -hmm. seen that happen. And and also others are growing by the way. They're raising traditional mushrooms, something that's really incredible. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I see Stephen. Okay, thank you very much. I concur with the previous speakers on the subject of the extent to which we have gone to reverse the climate change impact. As a natural resource ecologist, by training for both terrestrial or land resources and also aquatic or water resources, and have been having been longer, I'm um, close to 60 years, I must uh, admit that we have done more harm to the environment than good. Because the rate at which the biomass, especially of living plant resources, and by extension, the animal resources, because the plant resources tend to be the habitats or the living areas for their for their animal counterparts. So when the plants or the plant cover has been wiped out, it so follows that some organisms of all sizes, from minute soil organisms to invertebrates, those without backbone, and even mammals and birds, all have to follow suit and reduce in number. And unfortunately, the two extremes of uh, populations conspire to destroy the environment. 
the, the poor are somehow responsible for the degradation of the environment. For their big numbers and also prim primitive, primitive, primitive tools they use to eke a living out of the soil. And even the rich, because of this capitalistic greed for money, there is a lot of overharvesting of forest resources and unfortunately plantation, or rather natural forest resources. So that gentleman who asked whether there is a way we are trying to reverse the climate change impact, I can see we are in the overdrive to destroy the environment. Then to what extent are local communities practicing climate mitigation practices? On this one, because my other leg is in two agriculture advisory services, we have not done much. We still do the same things the same way while expecting different results, which according to some clever man is in itself madness. On a happy note, Minister of Agriculture is to implement starting from July. It is a five-year program to implement climate smart agriculture, which incorporates agriculture of all forms, urban farming, livestock farming, fish farming, and also crop farming. Otherwise, all the efforts in place as at the moment by both government practitioners and non-state or NGO actors is still patchy. If there is to be an assessment, it has to be done now. I don't think there is any competent body of government and non-state actors who may have quantified the extent to which we have engaged into adaptation and mitigation practices. Well, woodlots, agroforestry, one tree or two here and there, but we don't have one concentration zone which you can consider to be an area where one can boast of very rigorous climate change interventions. The water harvesting, some countries or part, or rather some parts of the country in the case of Uganda, they are roof catchment, especially a good part of the northern part of the country. The traditional housing index is not favorable for roof catchment water harvesting. The surface runoff, when it rains, or people scamper into their houses for shelter, while in drought-prone countries like Burkina Faso, when it rains, everybody moves out of the house to trap every drop of water that will be running about. Here, nature over-provided for us in the case of East Africa, and we took it for granted that it would remain the same to the extent that we have been caught off guard and we lack all the preparedness to, to do what we ought to do. At governmental level, we have got NAPA, National Adaptation Plan of Action. Last year, we passed a national climate change policy. So at the governmental policy formulation level, we are ahead. But at the implementation level, as it were, we are, not, uh, we are not yet at our best. Hopefully, the climate smart agriculture, which is to be implemented soon, will have to make a clear distinction of the worst we have been and how better we are able to move as a nation and together. Because it will be a nationwide program for implementation climate smart, smart agriculture, which may have to incorporate all good endeavors of climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies. Otherwise, we now rely largely on the non-state actors in the literal breakthrough that we may have had including action coalition on climate change in that front. Thank you. Thank you. And I also see Enoch. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, in the subsequent uh, submission uh, that was made by Stephen, uh, he touched uh, some of the angles of uh, uh, where you wanted to anchor my submission from. But that said, I want to make a blanket statement that the adaptive uh, 
capacity for communities to uh, climatic changes uh, is largely too um, low or it's mixed, uh, but uh, for our part, it is too low. And uh, I would say our communities are largely still vulnerable. Uh, if I talk about Uganda and the East African region, maybe the Sub-Saharan region minus South Africa. So that said, I need to um, make a submission that when it comes to a country like Uganda, agriculture is largely uh, uh, practiced or done by the households or individuals themselves, not the government. So I would say that 99% of the agricultural output from the, this country is largely produced by the individuals, especially if we are talking about the food crops, not the cash crops. So therefore, uh, when you talk about, um, and uh, for us uh, in our country, uh, it is largely rain-fed. We depend on nature. So it is nature which dictates the terms. Uh, we don't have uh, technology, we don't have those green kind of houses uh, like the Israelis have or you, the Italians, have. You know, for us, uh, it is the open agriculture, and uh, we still uh, uh, do much of agriculture in the traditional way. So we are still largely very vulnerable, and that's why uh, I would say uh, that our adaptive capacity is still questioned. But that said, how have they been able to cope uh, with the climatic changes that have, uh, that has, uh, that have affected uh, their economic activity? Uh, some of the communities have diversified, uh, their uh, sources of uh, income. Uh, to say uh, some have even started investing into the uh, social savings groups at the community levels. Uh, that is one way. Uh, others have diversified into uh, uh, the social services sector. You find that somebody is uh, owning a garden while at the same time he's owning a small uh, restaurant or a small shop to supplement on, uh, uh, on his uh, economic activity. That is to say, if there is crop failure, he's able to uh, leverage the survival uh, from the other source. But also, if I come to the urban setting, uh, where I think I, I am best, uh, you'll find that most of the urban dwellers currently, uh, having been shocked by the lockdown and the COVID-19, we've been taught a hard way uh, that the best way to do uh, to survive is to have our own food. So now we have a largely embraced urban farming. So I think this urban farming is, um, you find that somebody is having a small piece of land, but he's maximally utilizing it, uh, producing a range of uh, crops like the vegetables and other cereals, uh, which uh, supplement on the daily dietary kind of uh, uh, requirements. So I think I needed to make mention of that uh, so that we can uh, uh, be on the same page. Over to you. Thank you so much, Enoch. And now I see that there is a question from uh, Tommaso. So thank you, Tommaso. Uh, what do you think would be the role of biotechnology in contrasting climate change and providing new source of farms, vaccine, etc., at lower prices? I think that's really interesting. Who, who wanna answer this one? On the question, please. Sorry, I didn't hear you. I can't hear you now. Okay, Stephen. Okay, I've seen the question, and there is a somebody who wants us it reads what do you think could be the role of biotechnology in contrasting climate change and providing a new source of farms that is the pharmacy as it were vaccines etc at a, at, at a lower price yes well biotechnology incidentally and the, what goes with it 
and sometimes synonymous with genetically modified organisms in our case as Uganda has not been embraced. However, I must say that our national agricultural research system has leaped ahead of times and we now have core manpower equipped with all the fundamentals of biotechnology and also genetically modified technology. Where we, until recent, until 2021, we had the Ministry of Science and Technology in place. However, it was disbanded and now placed under, it is a department under the president's office. We happen to have a president who is passionate about science and technology and is uh, promoting what we call science-led development agenda to the extent that uh, the remuneration for scientists has been enhanced to hand some pay, some extent. And now in his pronouncements, he has talked about path pathogen. Uh, my friends will have to, Ugandans will remind me, pathogen economy. Yeah, he has uh, pronounced himself on what he calls pathogen economy, and that was during the climax of the impact caused and harm caused on the nation of, of COVID-19. I don't know how much they are working in that regard of ensuring that we have a pathogen economy, or it becomes a core part of uh, income generation and therefore national development agenda. But what I can say is that much as biotechnology and indeed genetically modified organisms have not been fully embraced and even the president was not able to sign on the biotechnology bill because of the inherent fears associated with it. I can say and confidently so that we have not had much breakthrough into to the extent of having farms, vaccines, and the rest of the kind. However, there has been tick resistance in the livestock production. Almost all acaricides aimed at inheriting ticks which ticks are also adapting due to the changing climate. To the extent that we lose a lot of national heart tick and tick bond diseases. NARO, which is the National Agricultural Research Organization, has had a breakthrough into the development of vaccines, and they are now at a trial stage. And I should imagine that when assessment has been done and there have been fruitful results, that vaccine will have to be embraced in the entire country. We happen to have a whole huge cattle corridor of the cattle of the nation that is populated by approximately 15 million of cattle. So any breakthrough in the averting of the tick bone diseases by development of vaccine will have to develop a lot of confidence in our research scientists to look for vaccines even for other areas of agricultural production. We are not far, but we are on the move. I thank you. Thank you. And Edgar. Uh, thank you again for, for the opportunity to speak. Uh, to answer the question, just like uh, the previous speaker said, the country hasn't taken like huge steps in embracing biotechnology. But basically, the question wants us to draw light on the roles of type of biotechnology in a contrasting climate change. And uh, I think biotechnology is uh, very important eh, because of its uh, applicability. We see that through biotechnology, we can develop uh, drought resistant crops. Uh, crops that can be planted like in uh, drought conditions and be able to produce food in such areas. And this can be helpful in our country 
because uh, the drought affected climate areas are increasing in uh, in number and uh, we can also use biotechnology to develop crops like uh, that can fix various nutrients into the soil for example one of the basic nutrient uh, is nitrogen uh, which is fixed in the soil in form of nitrates and it is limited in supply but through biotechnology we can form crops like design crops that can fix nitrogen into the soil which increases it's like uh, availability into the soil so this can also be achieved through like uh, biotechnology and in the long run it can reduce the cost of farming because you won't have to use fertilizers like nitrates for example most of these fertilizers have nitrates in them so if you have a crop that naturally fixes nitrates nitrogen into the soil it will reduce the cost of farming then we can also use the, the biotechnology to develop uh, I think biofuels uh, are renewable sources of energy from plants and algae. Yeah, something like that. And also we can use our biotechnology to find new ways of storing the carbon dioxide, hence reducing the, the greenhouse, the greenhouse level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We can uh, we can genetically engineer crops that have a that have a high rate of photosynthesis hence can take up this carbon dioxide from the atmosphere at a high rate. So to conclude my points, we can use biotechnology to do a lot of things. It hasn't been taken up in our country, but uh, the ways are there. And if the government is serious about these ways, I think biotechnology is a, is a great initiative to venture into. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And maybe we have time for a last question. But before, I just want to remember you to fill the form that we'll send you in the chat, uh, which is an evaluation form to understand what you like the most or the least and to improve ourselves for the next time. So just to sum up what we say during this hour and a half, I would like to ask you uh, what are the main uh, recommend recommendations uh, for manage the climate change and protecting health? Like what can we do during our daily life? Okay, so uh, Edgar, I don't know if Stephen also had the hands up, but Edgar, please. Okay, personally, I take like uh, the, the, the environment as something part of me. So this helps me find ways out of combating climate change. Because I perceive the environment, the nature, as something connected to my body. The air I breathe like uh, half of my lungs are out there because I'm taking oxygen from the plants. So it means like a certain portion of my lungs is out there. So because of this awareness, it helps me in my daily life like uh, to, to be aware of like uh, to love nature and to I don't know if this is so practical and how I can teach this, but I think one of the best ways is to teach the young generation about climate change. If we sow the seed of climate change from the young generation, this seed can grow into like a, like you just need to teach, tell a child to grow this culture. It shouldn't be more about like a fighting climate change. It should be something like more of a culture, like a religion. And I think it starts from the from the young kids. If you go out and preach this gospel to the young kids, it can spread out to the whole world. So in conclusion, we should invest more in uh, teaching about climate change to the young generation. So it becomes something more of a, like a religion. Like you hear the story of Adam and Eve and it's all over your mind till you grow up. I think we need to develop such stories. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edgar. And Stephen, do you want to add something? I see your hand up. Or 
Enoch. Um, I think important that uh, as we talk about these issues of climate change, we must make sure that we live it, we love it, and we practice it. Mm. Because at an indiv uh, from an individual, we can have a higher multiplier effect mm. to the rest of the communities. I'm implying what we do in our daily lives, for instance, things to do with printing, why you could think you can avoid printing because the more you print on a piece of paper, the more you are inducing the cutting of forest somewhere in the DRC somewhere. So if you can do responsive uh, um, management of waste within your community, if you can avoid littering bottles, say, of water while you are driving everywhere as it is a practice in my country, I think you have done a very good job. You as a parent or as a teacher, can you live as an example? Can you teach your stu students what you wish or what you, you, you ought that should be done? Because let us not think that climate change is an animal which is very far away from us. It is us contributing collectively to climate change. Unless we understand this, then that's when we can be talking about climate change. Short of that, we are deceiving ourselves. I was in dark because here in Uganda it is, uh, it is now at night, but I thought I needed to bring my face here so that you see as a matter of emphasis, because I know at the end we've not interfaced. We didn't know this animal here. So I can take off my video again, then submit. Because oftentimes we say, let the government do this. But what shall you have done as an individual? We say, ah, let them do this. But what have you done? Because I think it has to do with the change of mind. How can our mind set be changed or tuned to accepting that we are responsible ourselves? So I don't think that the pollution or the climatic changes which we are experiencing in Uganda is largely caused by somebody else uh, or in another economy. It is we contributing to all this. So I think it's high time we changed our ideological thinking. Our attitudes should also change. Our behavior, our behaviors should also change, behavior change. Then collectively, individually, we can be able uh, to uh, uh, look at a generation that will be responsive and that will live in healthy life. Because I usually tell my children that when I leave this planet, I want to leave it in a good way that I, I found it, other than leaving you in a, an environment that is polluted, that will cause cancer to you. And I think as a responsible parent, I will not have done my job. Over to you. Thank you, Enoch. Okay, so I think that we have finished. I hope that you enjoyed it. I really want to thank all of you who follow with us and of course, Kuam and you guys from SCCC. You were amazing. Um, so just I just remember you the evaluation form, which is really important for us. And please, uh, Stephen, I see your hand. OK, this was just supplement to say, as the adage, adage goes, that any seed that will salvage the future of every society, of every country, must be sown in the garden of the young. As Enoka Wright put it, in the case of Uganda, we have 15 core million students and a good practice that will salvage the future in the direction of averting climate change, having clean environment. Of course, plastic pollution is already a menace all over the world. The young must be brought on board from family level, through community level, 
and correction centers of especially young people which are schools from nursery through the university, due diligence must be done to make sure that we restore our environment. Because we, some of us who are old enough, we lived in a better environment. We shudder to see how worst our environment is getting in the three domains of biosphere, that is the atmosphere, the lithosphere, and also the hydrosphere, which is water. Almost every sector of the biosphere is getting affected and the negative atmosphere, water, and even land and below the soil surface. So I call upon membership on this of this chat, plus your children, next of kin, siblings, and the rest of the kind, to be part of the team all out to save the Mother Earth, lest we leave this world worse than we found it, as Enoka Reiter put it. I thank you. Thank you. Enoch, do you want to add something? I see your hand up. <clears throat> I think this was something of the past. Uh, sorry, I forgot to uh, put my hand up because I saw okay. I need to look at you, but uh, <laughs> thank you. Okay, okay. So again, thank you, all of you. Uh, I don't know if, Chiara, do you want to add something? No, thank you, everybody, especially to the guys uh, of uh, ACTC Association. They have been very, very clear and uh, told me something I didn't know about Uganda and uh, its resources, so it has been very interesting. And uh, we have recorded this uh, uh, webinar in order to put in on uh, YouTube channel so that guys who couldn't uh, um, connect uh, this evening uh, can watch it uh, in the future. And thank you again and thank you very, very much, Ariana. Yeah, thank very you. Good. Yes. Bye bye. Bye to everyone. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.